Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the Meet the User Speaker Series. Uh, thank you very much for the for uh, joining us. As you know, the the Meet the User Speaker Series is our user engagement effort to bring together users from outside of NOAA and listen to how they use and apply Earth observations. Not all observations that are used come from NOAA, but it's an opportunity to uncover some of our NOAA assets to our users and also learn about how they are using them in society and what impacts they have. So uh, this happens and will be happening on a monthly tempo at noon. So please stay tuned to your email boxes as we will be sending out future speakers. Um, please also feel free to suggest future speakers and uh, and send us your thoughts on the speakers that we have. All of our sessions are recorded. And so you can always go back and uh, listen to some of your favorite speakers and we'll provide the links for the website and those resources on the next page at the very ending uh, slide. Okay, Lindsay, could you please advance? Okay, so our speaker today, I'm very excited to, uh, to present uh, Karen Gaffney, as well as Cass Green and Mark Tuckman. This is the North Coast Resource Partnership. And we have, uh, we have Karen, Cass, and Mark all giving a presentation um, as, a, as a group, as a tag team. So you'll hear them transition through their slides. Um, this team is fantastic. We actually have a very long time relationship uh, moving across carbon. Um, I think we're going back more than 12 years, Karen. So thank you uh, for being here. Um, Karen and her partners are satellite data users, incredibly sophisticated decision support entity um, in terms of tribal and county and decision making for the North Coast region. We bring together uh, this team as they talk across tribes, counties, and private non-governmental and municipal stakeholders. And they are really integrated in the development of fine scale decision support maps. Um, they look to screen and prioritize landscapes for activities like fuel reduction, bioenergy, and they're longtime integrators for the purposes of policy, decision making, and sustainable land use. The North Coast uh, really looks at an entire ecosystem that touches wildfire, water resources, forest management, and carbon. Um, I'm incredibly honored uh, to, to have them here as our speakers, and I think it will work uh, very well in terms of connecting with our NESDIS offices in terms of supporting um, instruments, products, and services. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Karen. Thank you. And let's see. Let's go to the next slide. We should be kicking you guys off. Please, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much, Vanessa, and good morning, everyone, or good afternoon out there. Um, Karen Gaffney, and I'm going to just set some context about the North Coast Resource Partnership and the region, and then most of the talk will be covered by uh, Cass Green and Mark Tuckman, and then hopefully we'll have some time for some robust discussion about the approaches that we're using in the North Coast and all of California. So the North Coast Resource Partnership was formed in 2005. And it's a coalition of thousands of stakeholders in the North Coast region of California. And that includes tribes and local governments, but also NGOs, RCDs, private sector firms, uh, cities, et cetera. And we have a leadership council that's comprised of appointees from the region's tribes. There are 30 federally recognized tribes in the North Coast of California and many non-federally recognized tribes. And that leadership council is comprised of appointees from those tribes as well as counties. So we like to call it uh, you know, democracy at its finest, but a lot of these leadership council members are representing much broader constituencies in the region. And there's a focus on, on equity and transparency and including everybody kind of having an all boats rise with the tide approach and developing a shared vision for the region for both the landscapes and the ecosystems and the communities in the region and their health and vitality. We have a really strong emphasis on state and federal partner collaboration, including long-term collaboration with NOAA on fisheries and a number of other things, as, as Vanessa noted. And the partnership uh, relies upon Western and tribal science. So a lot of the work you'll hear about from Cass and Mark regarding you know, landscape scale, remote sensing and LIDAR and, and use of instruments and analyses. Uh, is integrated with local data and local knowledge, whether that's from local landowners, 
um, or you know NGOs, but also our tribes in, in terms of utilizing traditional ecological knowledge. And then we use this integrated approach to data to prioritize and implement projects and actions on the ground that benefit uh, North Coast region landscapes and communities. And we have roughly a, a 95 to five ratio of implementation to planning. So although we place a strong emphasis on data and science and analysis to drive our decision-making, we're really about getting projects on the ground. There's also a strong focus on efficient and effective use of public dollars. And so in service of that, a lot of focus on performance metrics and reporting on return on investment. Uh, next slide, please. So the partnership focuses on array of objectives and benefits for the region. And you can see here the list ranging from forest health and fuel load reduction to water quality, climate action, economic vitality, community health and safety, but also functional built infrastructure and the conservation of working and natural lands. Next slide, please. And this is the region in which we operate. You can see the map on the left. So all of uh, all are part of seven North Coast counties and the tribal lands therein. It's about 19,000 square miles. You can see a very significant uh, coastline area there, and it's 12% of California. So very large region at which to be operating is why we need to have really great data products at the regional scale to prioritize projects. Um, it's also an economically disadvantaged region with about 50% of the population living under the po poverty line, and it's a very rural region. It's a source region for forest-based carbon and water and biological diversity, so there's a lot of benefits that flow to other parts of the state and the nation and the world. Next slide, please. I just noted in the chat that someone is saying they're not seeing the slides, um, so just assuming others are able to see them. So uh, let me know if there's a problem there. Um, okay, all right, great, thank you. Uh, here's, uh, so the North Coast is this really important region in terms of um, benefits to the rest of California and the nation, and it's been disproportionately impacted by uh, fires, for example, and other disasters. So you can see on the left, the fire history from 1980 through 2000 in the North Coast region. And then on the right, uh, an uptick in the number of fires and their severity. So even though we're 12 percent of California, the North Coast region has experienced over 25 percent of the state's fires in the last five years. And that, of course, has led to uh, loss of life, as well as major impacts to the economies of the region and um, uh, the natural resources and ecosystems in the region. Next slide, please. And of course, a loss of forest-based carbon. So the partnership uses an adaptive planning and prioritization framework. It's quite a formal uh, framework for uh, prioritizing its work. And so that includes the integration of regional assessments and spatial analysis and modeling with indigenous <clears throat> science and local expertise. And so those are intentionally uh, pulled into an integrated framework, which, which then drives the identification of strategic actions and projects the prioritization and evaluation and selection of those projects and strategic actions in a very formal way, and then the collaborative and multi-objective plan development. We also have a really strong focus on technical assistance and capacity building to ensure that everybody has the opportunity to participate in this regional planning effort and to identify projects that are important for their community or their ecosystems. And then um, part of this adaptive planning prioritization framework is then to plan, it, to implement the plans and then report on their return on investment. So are, are they successful? We have a pretty rigorous performance reporting framework with really detailed metrics on all of the kind of thematic areas in which we work. And then of course that information from the performance reporting comes back to you know, re-inform the process and refine it over time. All of this is overseen and driven by the decision making from our tribal and county representatives. Next slide, please. And so that adaptive planning and prioritization framework has resulted in um, a recently approved plan called the Vision for North Coast Resilience. And this plan provides background information and um, 
uh, data, including much of the incredibly uh, valuable analyses that were done by Tuckman Geospatial and Cass Green Associates, and that we'll be building on over time. But how we prioritize projects and strategies, there's well over 50 um, types of solutions listed in the plan that address an array of um, objectives for the region. Uh, kind of in that same uh, earlier slide I talked about regarding, you know, community health and safety and uh, ecosystem function, et cetera, and economic vitality. Uh, I would invite you to take a look at this plan and give us your feedback. It is adaptive in nature to digital plans, so we're constantly updating it. Um, and we look forward to having um, uh, your thoughts about how we could better represent the great work that you're doing in the region. Uh, next slide, please. And so although, you know, I certainly am very focused on the North Coast Resource Partnership region that we just talked about, um, because it's an economically disadvantaged region and has a lot of, you know, underrepresented communities that have challenges with um, you know, leveraging big data. We rely on the incredible partnership of people like Cass and Mark, who are working at the state and national, in some cases, international level on, um, you know, refining data and mapping products. And so um, they'll be talking a bit about uh, amazing work that they're doing throughout California and then how we're leveraging that into the North Coast region. And it's a real benefit for an economically disadvantaged region to be able to take advantage of learnings um, that have been developed by Cass and Mark and others um, through other parts of California and then apply them to the North Coast Resource Partnership. We gain some really significant economies of scope and scale uh, by taking that approach. And so they've been on an ongoing basis supporting us and helping us with our you know, regional analyses. And, um, and we are excited to continue to work with them. And we'll share at the end of this kind of some of our current uses and future needs for federal satellite data and NOAA products. And if we have time, Mark is also going to share um, kind of a, a new um, initiative that he's working on called the Wildfire Fuel Mapper. Um, and we'll share that at the end if we have time. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our absolutely key partners, um, Cass Green and Tuckman Geospatial. Thank you, Karen. Thanks very much. And uh, could I suggest that you put the link to the, the plan in the chat for everybody, and then they'll be able to get it really easily. Thank you. Will do. Sure. So thanks very much. Um, so as Karen said, I'm going to give an overview <laughs> of some of the projects that Mark and Karen and I have been working on over the last nine years. And um, I want to do that because I want to show how these projects are locally driven and locally focused. And I think that's really important message to get to people that these are all bottom up projects instead of top down. And that leads to the success. So over the last night year, uh, nine years, we've had eight local consortia in California that have raised the funds for creating fine scale vegetation and wildland fuel uh, and wildfire hazard and risk maps for approximately 20 million acres across 20 ca uh, counties in California. Next slide. And uh, I'm not gonna go detail about each one of these, but these are the different consortium. You've got the North Coast Resource Partnership for uh, California North Coast. And that is uh, approximately half of the area that we have worked on. So that's a huge area. And then Sonoma and Napa, I'm just going to go to the map and kind of talk about these a little bit more. But these projects are all incrementally moving forward. And next slide. That got mixed up. Okay, I'll go to this and then we'll go to the map. So uh, some of the products, these are these are vary by county and they're way more than these. But these are the main products we've been providing um, and working with people. But the big one is Q1. Uh, uh, QL1 LIDAR, um, and that has been critically important. And last year, Karen was able to lead the partnership in getting a seven and a half million dollar grant um, from both the California Resources Agency and the um, USGS for Q1 LIDAR for most of the North Coast Resource Partnership. So that's an incredibly important data set for us. We also use ortho imagery and luckily the NAEP program, the National Agricultural Imagery Program provides excellent imagery every other year for the whole state of California. So that's great. We use those data sets and a lot of field work to produce the products that our partners are using. 
uh, ladder fuels, um, uh, countywide fuels, uh, topographic layers, impervious, pervious mapping, uh, and then uh, fine scale vegetation, and then uh, data access portals. And Mark will be showing that off a little bit, but this is gets the all of the data goes into the public domain and, and it's made really easily accessible, which is critically important for the success of these projects. Next slide. Um, so how's the data being used? It's um, being used in, in multiple different applications and Mark's gonna go into more detail uh, about these applications, but we've got um, you know, watershed and flood management, wildfire planning and response, that is the biggest use at this point. Uh, it is California and we are burning on a regular basis. So that's a, a, a very important uh, uh, application. But the applications go on and on. And again, Mark will be showing some of those. Next slide. Example partners that have come in and funded these projects and the partnership list goes on to 200 or more projects. But you can see it's national agencies, it's foundations, it's um, state agencies, and then it's local uh, users, I mean, down to specific lumber companies. So there's a, a huge base of funding with uh, CAL FIRE at California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, and USGS being perhaps the most significant funders um, in all the different projects, but it goes on and on. And I think, we may have lost the slide in the transition that is the map. It, we'll go to the next slide and see if that's, it shows up. Nope, it's not. So can, uh, I wanna kind of talk to the area. It is the entire North Coast, uh, the counties that, uh, for the North Coast Resource Partnership. It's also the entire Bay Area, all the counties in the Bay Area, ex except for Solana County. Uh, it also goes down the Central Coast now to Santa Cruz, um, San Mateo, um, Monterey counties and San Benito and San Luis Obispo County. So it's, as I said, it's about 20 million acres in the state of California that have been able to build these data sets. So I want to just talk about the reasons for success, because I think we've been able to develop a model that it can be used other areas. Um, and the first and most important reason they're successful is they're locally inspired and they're locally led. They are led, most importantly, by organizations who are engaged, passionate, collaborative, and committed to building these fundamental data sets to support their uh, land management and policy making. Um, and that's key. There has to be an organization that wants to take this on and really go for it. So that's really important. The organization has to be trusted by the other consortium members. Usually there are 20 to 40 members in the consortium, but that lead organization has to be trusted uh, by the members. And it has to be led by individuals. Those organizations, the one that's going to take, the person that's going to take the project management on has to be uh, an individual who's also personally engaged, passionate, collaborative, and committed. And um, that's a Karen Gaffney. I mean, Karen really started this whole project, the, these whole combinations of projects off with the Sonoma County uh, project and now is leading the North Coast Resource Partnership Project. So you need those key individuals who are committed and passionate, and they, they have to be part, they have to lead the project, um, and they have to be trusted by all the other consortium members. And again, this is all ground up. And then there needs to be a, a willingness to be fast on your feet, to, you know, things always break, um, to be able to welcome chaos and learn from it. Um, there's less and less of that now, but there's always something goes wrong and you've got to, you know, be willing to take the blows. And then ne next slide, please. And then uh, other reasons for success, the continual decline of cost of the ortho imagery and the LIDAR data, um, but not just um, those data sets, but other data sets that are being produced by NOAA and NASA and USGS. These are data sets, and Mark will talk to this, that are critical, critical input. And as those costs, as that data becomes free um, or it, the cost goes down, that has been able to support all of these uh, projects. There's a reliance on established standards. Um, you know, USGS has LIDAR standards, California Native Plant Society and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, vegetation standards for fuels classes, the Forest Service fuel standards 
So there's this reliance on standards so that most of these projects are based on counties or combination of counties. Um, they are also, there's, you, there's no edge matching that has to be done because the standard classification schemes are being used across the entire region. Um, there's innovative technologies, you know, image segmentation and uh, machine learning. And then most importantly, the ability to make the products widely and easily accessible on the web. This is important just to get the, hands in, the data into the hands of people, but it also builds a consortium for the project, a wide based consortium, because people don't have to be GIS or remote sensing dweebs to use this data. They just have to care about the land and care about the policy about the land and the land management. And they can then they can easily get those tools. So that's kind of an overview of all these projects. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Mark, who will talk in more detail about the products that are being created. Great, thanks Cass. Um, maybe before we do, if, if you all wouldn't mind just showing that map that I put in the chat, um, that would be great. Cause then uh, we could just show you that geography that Cass tried uh, described. Uh, um, and if not, I can just go, or we could do that at the end too. Um, but I put a map in the chat that shows the the geography that Cass was talking about. Um, and Mark, I, yep. We'll Vanessa. integrate that. We'll integrate that map into the final deck. Lindsay would have to stop presenting, so gotcha. we'll bring it in at the end when you transition, if that's yep. okay with you. That sounds great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna show some data sets. I'm gonna um, just sort of demonstrate the, the kinds of data that we've been rolling out across the, the, this area of Central California and Northern California, um, it, you know, really uh, in these different bins to improve topographic, hydrologic and built area mapping, vegetation, forest health and management, and then really, really important wildfire impacts and fuels mapping. Um, uh, and then I'm gonna talk at the end about some of the sort of region-wide NCRP North Coast Resource Partnership assessments that we're doing. So let's, let's go to the next slide and I'll start with just uh, showing data. I'm really gonna just show a lot of, of what these data, these improved data look like. So, you know, the the LIDAR and these, and other, these other sort of New, new data sets are helping us improve uh, our topographic mapping, our hydrologic mapping, our infrastructure mapping. This slide shows the, um, on the, the two right images show the LIDAR derived hill shade, uh, which is you know, really an example of how LIDAR it helps with topographic mapping. You know, it lays bare the landscape at a really high degree of detail. It helps us map stream morphology. It helps us map slope and aspect really accurately. Um, trees, or excuse me, roads under canopy, trails under canopy, and you can see that, especially in the quality level one LIDAR products that, that we're getting now, um, the highest level. So uh, you can go to the the next slide, please. Um, and then uh, the, the hydrology, uh, this image shows the LIDAR derived hillshade with the old pre-LIDAR NHD flow lines or stream center lines laid on it. And you can see how, how the, you know, the accuracy is not great and the detail is not great, but with der by deriving Hydro, hydrology and, and stream center lines from LIDAR, we get a, a whole a much improved level of detail and accuracy. Um, and you can go to the next part of this animation and you can see those, those center lines. And so that's incredibly important for an organization like the North Coast Partnership, who you know, is managing an area that has some of the last, you know, natural runs of salmonids, for example, in 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 the country. So, um, really important data. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this this slide illustrates a similar sort of data deliverable, where we're using lidar to map functional riparian areas. You know, again, at real a detail that we could never have done before. The, LIDAR. Um, and you can see here the blue areas are represent channel channels. 
the the red lines represent top of bank, and then the green areas represent floodplains. Um, and you know, the, to have these riparian areas mapped accurately is super important. They're really important from a from a biodiversity perspective. In Northern California, riparian areas represent maybe 5% of the landscape. So they're, they're rare um, on the landscape and, and very important. So um, we're, we're you know, really able to, to map these with the new data. If you go to the next slide, you can see the derivative that's used, to, the LIDAR derivative, to, that's used to map the functional riparian areas. It's called height above river. Um, it, it rep, the pixel values in this data set represent the elevation above the nearest stream center line. So it's what people call a relative elevation model. Um, really, really useful data. Next slide, please. Another data set that we're producing for all these, these areas is uh, impervious surfaces maps. And these are developed from NAEP imagery, from LIDAR-derived building footprints, and from LIDAR intensity as well. Uh, maps the landscape into areas of impervious cover versus areas of pervious cover. The impervious is mapped into several classes, buildings, dirt and gravel roads, other dirt and gravel, other paved and paved roads. And this is used for stormwater modeling. Um, and it's also used as we develop our fuel models, which are used in fire behavior modeling. Um, it gives us a really good idea of where the non-burnable landscape is and also where the buildings are on the landscape. Uh, next slide, please. We produce vegetation maps, two different kinds, enhanced life form and fine scale. Um, these rely on uh, the, the enhanced life form, which is shown here, is a 25 class vegetation map that relies on NAEP imagery and then LIDAR derivatives, including the canopy height model and canopy cover. Um, and you can go through this animation if you just click the next um, next slide button. I think we'll see the canopy height model. There, there's the canopy cover. So that's a an input to the enhanced life form. And I think the next one or the one before will show the canopy height model. Um, there it is. So the canopy height model gives us the height for each one meter pixel, the height of that pixel above the ground. So those really dark green pixels are areas where it's actually redwood trees that are over right around 300 feet tall. Um, next uh, slide, and I think we'll get to the enhanced life form map in this zoomed in area. Again, this is a 25 class map, and this is just showing a very small area. So there's only a few classes showing, but the, this enhanced life form map is not that floristically detailed. It, the forest is broken up into classes like conifer, evergreen hardwood, deciduous hardwood. Um, next slide, please. And then the other type of vegetation map, which is much more floristically detailed, is what we call the fine scale vegetation map. And this divides the landscape up much more. So that area that is, say, deciduous hardwood in the enhanced life form map, in the fine scale map, it's broken down all the way to the what's called the National Vegetation Classification Alliance. So the those deciduous hardwood areas would be broken up into things like Blue Oak Alliance, Valley Oak Alliance, White Oak Alliance. Um, and the fine scale veg map is, um, has a number of inputs, canopy density, canopy volume profiles, I'll show examples of those, slope and aspect, and then moderate resolution satellite inputs that are used as predictor variables in machine learning like Landsat and Sentinel. Um, and when we have access to it, avarice uh, hyperspectral data. Uh, next slide. And this is what canopy density gives us uh, information about the density of the forest canopy 
um, above 15 feet is what we use as sort of our cutoff for tree for trees. Next uh, slide. The canopy volume profiles give us sort of information about the density of vegetation in each of a number of vertical stratum of the forest canopy. These are really important to as predictor variables in machine learning to get to that fine scale map class. Next slide, please. And then slope and aspect, really important in mapping vegetation. And this is all LIDAR derived. Um, next slide, please. And here's the fine scale veg map for that same area we showed the enhanced life form map. And you'll just see that there's, mit, there's much more detail in, that, in the fine scale map. Um, if you click the next slide, it'll show that map. So where an area was mapped as conifer in the enhanced life form map here, it's mapped as Douglas fir and redwood um, as separate, separate classes. And you can see the area of developed on the far uh, east side of this map um, and shrubland in orange here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we're doing a lot of work around forest health um, and forest management. Uh, and a couple of the data sets that we're producing to support that work from the LIDAR are tree approximate objects and canopy gaps and canopy height change. Um, next slide. So this, this illustrates tree approximate objects. Tree approximate objects are individual trees or, or small groups of trees that we can um, extract as polygons from um, the LIDAR data from the canopy height model. Uh, and this is gives us sort of a level of, of fine scale mapping that we've never had been able to do. Um, and it allows for things like, you know, tree-based analysis, mapping carbon at a, a, a more detailed, um, in a more detailed way, um, and then even classifying individual trees with their species, um, which is sort of the next, the next phase in the evolution of vegetation map and we're mapping. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. Um, next slide, please. And using um, LIDAR, especially when we have two dates of LIDAR to map canopy gaps and the changes in canopy height. Um, and this is really useful for identifying areas of the forest canopy that have died back as a result of here drought uh, in this area or infestations of pests and pathogens. We have lots of uh, 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 bark beetles killing our trees and fur engravers and other insect pests, um, or just for, tra for tracking um, places where trees have been removed for forest management. We can do this using two, two dates of LIDAR and comparing the two dates. Um, and this animation will illustrate that. Um, the image on, on the screen now shows uh, uh, the landscape in 2010. This is in Marin County. And if you hit the next button, we'll see the landscape in 2020. And you can see on the imagery that, you know, there's a loss of, of a, a bunch of Douglas fir was removed from this meadow. Um, and what we do with the LIDAR is we compare the pre and post LIDAR to get uh, a map of change. And if you hit the next button, it'll show that map. So there you can see the areas where the canopy height decreased greater than 30 feet, um, and then areas where it decreased between six and 30 feet over that time period. <clears throat> um, next slide, please. So mapping wildfire impacts and fuels and mapping fuels is really something that we're, we're really focused on. Karen talked about it a lot. It's, you know, this area has been um, absolutely just uh, de decimated in some areas by, by fire and really high intensity fire and repeated fire, wildfire. 
Um, so we are using the, these data, the LIDAR, the, the imagery, the satellite data, uh, the weather data from NOAA to uh, map ladder fuels and wildland fuels and hazard and risk out on the landscape. That picture is a Karen Gaffney photo um, that she took during the 2017 Tub, uh, I think it was the Tubbs fire. Uh, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, maybe it was the, um, the Kincaid, but Bye. the fire Bye. came right to, down to her, to yeah. her house there. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. If you so are ladder just joining, please make sure you mute your microphones. Thank you. Ladder fuels um, are derived from la LIDAR. Ladder fuels um, for us are the, the, is the density of vegetation in the one to four meter above ground strata. So really the, the fuels that are close to the ground. And those fuels are really important because they can carry a, a sort of um, beneficial um, or innocuous ground, ground fire um, up into the canopy uh, of the forest canopy in, and which results in a crown fire, um, which is very, very difficult to control and, and can be really destructive. So those ladder fuels are important to manage and mitigate. And this, um, by having a, a map of those, uh, which is illustrated here, uh, it gives us it gives us a, a a guide to where those fuels are, um, and that's important for um, fuel reduction prioritization. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> wildland fuels and wildfire hazard and risk mapping. Um, wildland fuels um, we create five meter Scott and Bergen fuel models. Um, those are inputs to the wildfire behavior models. And um, it, it's the, the, the fuel models that we're creating are based on our LIDAR derived vegetation maps and LIDAR derived forest structure and ladder fuels, which is a higher, res those are higher resolution data sources than the de facto standard fuel model, which is land fire, which is based on a 30 meter uh, moderate Landsat data. So um, we, we've been creating these five meter fuel models um, for all the counties that we're working in. Um, and I think you can go to the next slide. There's a little animation here, um, just illustrating the workflow for the crosswalk to the Scott and Bergen fuel model using life form, ladder drive canopy cover, the ladder fuels, veg height, and where it's where the landscape is burned after the LIDAR, we use burn severity to adjust the fuel models. Um, next slide. And this is an example of our hazard mapping for Santa Clara and Santa Cruz counties. Um, ranking the landscape by its wildfire hazard. Um, and if you go to the next slide, uh, this is our wildfire risk to structures data set, which combines wildfire hazard with housing density from the LIDAR data. So this gives um, folks that are planning fuel treatments information about where the hazard is highest and and where uh, the, the, the homes are on the landscape, which is helpful in prioritizing activities that reduce hazardous fuels. Um, so we're doing these hazard uh, wildfire risk to structures maps in several counties uh, right now. Next uh, slide. And this is actually, this is the logic model for the, both the classified wildfire hazard and the wildfire risk to structures maps. Um, I don't, I sh don't, sh I don't want to numb, you, put you to sleep with this, but the reason I'm showing it is because one of the inputs to these data sets is extreme fire weather potential, which you can see in the middle. It's like second from the top under flame length. Um, 
that data set is built off of the NOAA NAR, um, which will, the NCEP NAR, which I think if you go to the next slide, I provide some detail on this. Um, so this, this is an example of, of the extreme fire weather potential. It's very low resolution just because it's based on weather station data, but it's the best available data set that we have for assessing where the extreme fire weather potential is on the landscape. And it's derived from the NCEP NAR. And if you go to the next slide, I'll show you the sort of um, the way it's created. So this is this is actually done by a meteorologist up in Fortuna, which is up uh, almost in Oregon. It's um, by a, a Alan Fox, and uh, he, we've done this now in a, a number of of areas. But uh, Alan downscaled the fire season weather data. So really, weather data from September, October. August, September, and October. Um, downscaled that NAR data, um, and then from it derived fire a fire spread index across the landscape for, for, for all the pixels on the landscape. And then we took the 97th percentile FSI per pixel and used that as the proxy for extreme fire weather. And um, the, Dave Sapsis, who's a uh, a real um, incredibly knowledgeable uh, person at CAL FIRE um, doing great work around fire um, hazard modeling is also using the NAR data for, for ember load modeling, which is really cool. Working with uh, Pyrologics out of um, Missoula, Joe Scott. Um, so they're doing good work there. Um, next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to just talk about a couple of of um, of the NCRP, the North Coast Resource Partnership assessments that we're doing that build on the work that we've that we're doing in these Bay Area counties, um, and a lot of the, there's a lot of overlap between the work, um, and I just wanted to show this, these maps because they kind of put the region into context. It's a 19, it's a 12 million acres. Uh, area. So it's this massive area. And uh, Karen mentioned it before, but it really is like a very, very rural area with very low population density, just a few, um, you know, Santa Rosa is the big city and everything else is really little. It's, it's, I, everyone, for everyone out in DC, just, I uh, wish we had some photos to show you, but it's an amazing, amazing region. It's a source region for so much of the state's sort of natural resources. And um, here's, here's some maps that just illustrate the, um, the area. And you can see on the right that on that public man's, lands map, there's a really big dichotomy between or a bifurcation between the east and the west where the, the east is dominated by public lands and the west is dominated by private lands. A lot of like industrial timberland on the west side of the region. Also, you can see how the, the the preponderance of fire is in the interior, which is much drier, more arid than the than the more temperate and moist uh, coastal area of the region. Um, next slide, please. So here's one of the kind of numerous assessments that we've done recently for. The, the region is the, the communities at risk to wildfire assessment, which uh, in really investigates the exposure and vulnerability of this region to wildfire. Um, we, for its inputs, are, we use burn probability, housing use, unit density, and social vulnerability index. So there's a component of social vulnerability and looking at the communities that are most at risk, but those that are also socially uh, disadvantaged or economically disadvantaged. Um, th what this does is it gives us, a, like based on quantitative information, gives us a, li a list, a ranking of the, the communities that have the most housing units vulnerable to wildfire. Um, and the, the, the top 25 are showing in, in, in yellow here. It's a little hard to see, but, um, and you can see they're, they're, they're 
concentrated in the interior, which is much more prone to these large, um, really mega fires. Um, <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. Another uh, region-wide assessment is assessment of carbon stocks and above ground biomass. Uh, this was done um, by a partner, uh, John Nickerson, um, Dogwood Springs Forestry here and just north of here um, in Ukiah. Uh, he analyzed um, the, uh, the uh, Landsat and uh, comp combined uh, Landsat and FIA data um, and land fire data to estimate um, carbon sequestration by life form and by pool. So above ground live, above ground dead, below ground and below and soil carbon. Um, and this is really useful for the for the partnership in understanding where the carbon is on the landscape. Uh, next slide, please. I think it's gonna go back to you, Karen, here. Great, thank you so much, Mark and Cass. Just really appreciate um, all the long-term partnership on this really important information. So just to close here, and then we'll, if we have time, we'll ask Mark to talk a little bit about this new initiative he's working on with Cass, the Wildfire Fuel Mapper. Um, so we're using um, uh, NOAA data, as Mark shared, in a variety of ways that are very powerful in terms of prioritizing projects and just enhancing the quality of life for the ecosystems and communities in the North Coast. And um, we've been building on uh, foundational data sets and utilizing them for the last 18 years and are really kind of moving into overdrive right now, given the amount of funding that's coming through the state of California and nationally for uh, wildfire resilience, for other forms of resilience, aquatic ecosystem function, et cetera. So our next phase, especially now that we have the LIDAR data coming on, on board that Mark talked about, is to really um, find funding, and, and some of which we have found funding for, for LIDAR derivatives and their applications to the multiple objectives that the North Coast Resource Partnership is working on. Uh, we are planning to do a very detailed regional aquatic ecosystem protection and enhancement program. Very excited to talk with NOAA about partnering more strongly on that, both with instruments and data, but also through your fisheries program. Uh, the state of California and the federal government, of course, are working together on a 30 by 30 program to protect and enhance biological diversity in one of the most biologically diverse states in in the nation. Um, we will are partnering on that and are working closely with them and also working on climate adaptation plans, continuing to refine our, refine our wildfire risk and resilience strategies and projects and then monitoring them over time. Um, we also do a lot of work on socioeconomic evaluations and capacity assessments and know that NOAA does a lot of work in that area and would welcome the opportunity to work more closely with you on that. Um, and then of course, we have a lot of failing infrastructure in the North Coast, whether that's water and wastewater infrastructure or broadband or communications. Um, and so very interested in the relationship between the natural world and ecosystems and functional built infrastructure and how they interact with one another. And then finally, of course, always top of mind community health and safety, which touches on so many of the areas, whether it's watershed health and water quality, but also certainly um, extreme events like flooding and uh, impacts from climate change and sea level rise and of course wildfire. So very much look forward to continuing the conversation. I want to thank you so much for inviting us to be part of this conversation. And if we have time, Vanessa, um, I'll defer to you as to whether you'd like Mark to talk about the wildfire fuel mapper or whether you want to open it up for questions. Thanks, Karen. Uh, and thank you, Mark. And thank you, Cass. I appreciate uh, just the sequence and how you presented this and took us from all of the information that you in you integrate and you use down to this wildfire story that I know we have um, a lot of a lot of work on. We have the NOAA fire program. Um, so I want to open it up for some quick questions to see if there's anybody in the audience who would like to ask. Uh, you can either put your question in the chat and we can go ahead and read it for you if your mic isn't working or you can just unmute yourself and uh, and ask your question. If we don't have questions, I will 
put it back over to Mark because I would love to see um, his model demo. Okay, and thank you. I do see a comment from uh, from Joe Conran. Um, it's not sure if it's a perfect fit, but recommending the bi uh, bipartisan infrastructure and inflation reduction funding opportunities. Um, so thank you, Joe. Uh, Joe is with our NOAA chief economist team. And so uh, he looks at a lot of use cases and a lot of what they're doing is looking at the return on investment. So um, lots of great feedback and recommendations there. So thank you, Joe. And while we're waiting for questions to come up in the chat, Mark, why don't you go ahead and pull up uh, your model because I think this is a great um, conversation builder and we can always record our questions that come up in the chat and address them afterwards um, via email. That's good. I I think I need permission to share my screen here. Sure, no problem. Great. And maybe I'll also just quickly show that. Well, until we get a question, I'll just also show that map that, that we for Cass to narrate a little bit real quick. Sure. And Mark, oh, as you're pulling question. it up, yep. yeah. as you're pulling it up, we'll read the questions. And I'll stop you maybe one or two minutes before the top of the hour to close up and give people information on how to find your slides in the recording. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mark, just go right to the wildland fuels map. OK, you. sure. You, you got it in the chat. I think people saw it. It's fine. Got it. Great. Um, yeah, I still don't have that share button uh, enabled, but it looks like um, there's a question here from Jason Cooper. Thanks, Jason. It says, are you using any precipitation data in your applications, either near real time or historic? We, we do use precipitate, we use the PRISM data for, um, as a predictor, variable in our vegetation mapping. Um, we use fuel moisture data in our wildfire behavior models. Um, and one of the thing, one kind of one of the data gaps that we're hoping to fill is kind of real time remote sensing based fuel moisture data. Um, that's a data gap. Um, so I, I, that hopefully answers that question a little bit. Our climate here is a Mediterranean one, so we, we don't get rain between June and September. Uh, looks like another question from Tan. Um, can you elaborate on the need for environmental data info for renewable energy from the California coast? Karen, maybe Karen has some thoughts there. Um, yeah, just real quickly, it's such a great question. There's, as you probably know, significant expansion of offshore wind energy off the Humboldt coast, and it's being explored off the Mendocino coast as well, both of which are part of the North Coast region. Um, so, you know, absolutely any information about, you know, seafloor structure or sea level rise projections, um, as well as sensitive resources that could be impacted by, um, you know, the development of offshore energy are really important data sets, as well as, of course, various climatic, uh, you know, wind, et cetera, uh, data sets. Maybe Mark and Cass, you have more to add to that? I don't. I know that I, I know that NREL has good data, good wind data, and that, that those data are being used to assess feasibility for wind offshore wind projects. And the, the I think you can share now, Mark, if you want to try. Um, sure. The question about lidar uh, with and Vanessa partially answered this with the three DEP program. Um, USGS's 3D program, they are wonderful partners to have. And uh, we've been able, you know, they'll come in with 25 to 50% of the funding. And uh, then you can raise money around that anchor uh, funding from them. And it, and it works really well. Yes, it's hard to get uh, LIDAR for islands, uh, but we did actually map the National Parks of America Samoa with 
LIDAR data that I'm pretty sure, I'm not sure NOAA paid for it or if it, if it was USGS product. So it can be done for sure, but it's, it's more of an issue with, um, with, with the islands. But you can do a lot of these data sets without LIDAR. It won't be as good or as accurate, uh, but you can certainly build powerful data sets to support your decision making. Thank you, Cass. And Mark, I know we're running close to time, but we've we've talked up um, the opportunity for you to share. So if you're able All right. to, why yes, don't you go yes, ahead yes. And, and put it up? Definitely. And, yeah. So and, this this is our wildfire fuel mapper that we've created for. This is in Sonoma County, but we're it's being expanded to to other counties. And the idea of this is that a landowner can go to their parcel, they can type an address, and get a bunch of PDF maps for their parcels. So someone who has no idea how to use GIS, but wants to have a set of maps that they can use to sit down to plan a, a fuel reduction project on their land. And often they'd be sitting down with like someone like a forester or, or some kind of advisor, an RCD person, an extension agent. And it gives, uh, you know, this basis for starting to plan a project. So if you this is just an embedded web map in the wildfire fuel mapper site, and you could type your address in and get to a parcel. And then you download this report, which I just did. I'm going to open it in my desktop app here so and change this to 100%. And uh, so this is the PDF that you get for your for your parcel. And it, the first page just shows a sort of a key to the information that's provided. And then we can scroll down and you can see that this, this person's parcel is 103, you can see its acreage, its address, how it um, overlaps with several different maps of wildfire hazard um, and what its fire history is. So this parcel burned in 1944, and then in 2020, and then 1986 as well. So three times or parts of it have burned three times. Um, and then you get the set of maps for your parcel. So you can see the fire history on the left with the parcel in purple, the Cal Fire hazard, which is high for the parcel, and then the hazard from a more recent wildfire hazard map that we did of the parcel of the, of the That's county. Cool. And then That's you get really awesome. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, we were excited about these, uh, Vanessa. And, and, and Mark, yep. I apologize. I, I, I'm so sorry to, to cut you off because this is fascinating. We are at the top of the hour. So what I want to do is give people the opportunity to reach out to you. Um, mm -hmm. We'll keep you scrolling through this until we yep. close because I think it's phenomenal. But um, the, the message here is there is no data embedded here. But at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're communicating information. You're the, you're looking at the specific needs and gaps for the North, North Coast with fire, and you're providing it not only with the layers that are needed, but in the format that is most impactful to the decision makers and to the residents. And I think it's fascinating. Um, I love that there is a part in here, even though it's not NESDIS's mission to do fuel mapping, we still play a role in this here because you're using our information. So um, I, I like to highlight that because oftentimes we tend to think that if it's not in the mission, it might not be directly mapping to us or connecting back, but it, it is, there are very few boundaries that we're not touching. So I appreciate that. Um, I would love for people to um, reach out to you. And so we have shared your um, emails um, on our closing slide. Um, we will revisit this, Mark, and what we'll do is we'll make it available, um, you know, for people to, to reach out and we'll also have it recorded. Uh, I hated cutting you off. Um, no, no again, problem. It just, Thanks for having it, us. It's yeah. wanting more. So thank you to the three of you uh, for joining. Thank you for putting that up there, Lindsay. Um, and please recommend speakers. Uh, reach out to uh, North Coast here if you have any questions please contact me. We will have the recording, the transcript up for sharing as well as the slides. We will make sure to integrate that map into your deck and um, we will uh, we will follow up with questions directly. So uh, anything we can provide. Thank you to all supporting. Thank you to Cadmus for running this. 
and have a great lunch, everyone. Mark, uh, Karen, and Cass, again, you guys are wonderful. Thank you for that. Thanks, so thank Vanessa. You. Thanks great for having display. us. Thank you all.